Awesome. I think that we're on. Yes, I believe that we are now live. Very exciting. Okay. Um, well, thank you both so much for being here. Uh, today, I am joined by Dr. Kyle Myers and Pigeon Pagonis, and we are going to be talking about Kyle's memoir, uh, Raising Them, Our Adventure in Gender Creative Parenting, uh, which details Kyle's experience as a first-time parent raising a child without any kind of gendered restrictions or language. Um, Kyle Myers is a sociologist and has been globally recognized for their work advocating for gender creative parenting. Um, and Pigeon Pagonis is an artist, activist, and co-founder of the Intersex Justice Project. Uh, if you like this discussion, please consider buying a copy of the book. Um, you can buy Raising Them through our bookstore um, online at wellerbookworks.com over the phone at 801-328-2586 or in person at Trolley Square. Um, and also consider donating to the Intersex Justice Project because they're doing really important work. Um, and you can visit them on the web at intersexjusticeproject.org. Um, and before I turn the time over to Kyle and Pigeon, I just wanted to talk about a couple of the upcoming events at our bookstore. Um, on November 24th at 7 p.m., Kathy Kirkpatrick is going to be talking about her new book, American Prisoner of War Camps in Colorado. And she's going to be joined by Lynn Rave um, talking about his book, Images of America, Layton. And then on November 30th at 7 p.m., we have Elena Dillon talking about her new book, Mercy House, um, and chatting with Margot Orlando Little, who's talking about her new book, The Distance from Four Points. Um, and with all that being said, I am now gonna disappear and turn the time over. Um, if y'all have any questions for Pigeon or Kyle, please comment them down below and we'll end with a little Q&A. Thank you. Mm, thanks, Salem. Um, hey. Pigeon. It's so good to be with you. Yeah, it's so good to be with you. <laughs> um, well, we've talked a little bit about how this is going to go. I think it's going to be fun and casual and hopefully informative and inspiring. Um, who knows what's going on out there? Who knows if we're joined by one person, 10? I don't know. 30? I don't know. Can you see? I don't know. Um, but what we'll start with um, is I'll introduce myself and then um, you can introduce yourself and we'll go from there, okay? Okay. Uh, so I'm Kyle and for those of you who don't know me, I am a genderqueer woman. I use they, them, and she, her pronouns. I am a sociologist with a background in gender studies. I am the parent, uh, I am a parent of a rad little four-year-old named Zoomer who I didn't assign a gender to at birth. And I'm the author of Raising Them, Our Adventure in Gender Creative Parenting, which kind of chronicles that journey. It came out on September 8th. And I've been doing a lot of like virtual book touring over the last couple of months. And this event kind of bookends it. This is gonna be the last event for a little while. And I'm really grateful that it is being hosted by a local Salt Lake City bookshop and that I get to share this digital stage with someone who I really admire, Pigeon Pagonis. Um, would you mind introducing yourself, Pigeon, for the, the lovely audience? Not at all. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Pigeon. I use all pronouns, but I prefer they, them, if you need to know my preference. Um, I'm intersex and I live in Chicago. And I also am writing an autobiography, but I'm only on chapter three. And we are on the same publishing company, Little A Press and Topple um, Imprint. Mm -hmm. And I uh, don't have children, but I want a child. And if I have a child, I'll probably be basic and give them a gender. No, but I, I think I would love to raise them without a gender. And that's how I wish I was raised. But um, I was raised with a gender, unfortunately. But I think people like you who are doing this are um, pioneers and need a lot of support and probably don't have it. Uh, well, maybe you do, but... I feel like most of the spaces you probably enter and drift in and out of in like everyday like stuff like going to get food or whatever and paying the bills 
you probably don't have a lot of support there, but um, I'd be interested to hear if you have support like online and, and stuff like that. And I'm just happy you guys exist, you people doing this with your kids, because it's really what we need, especially for intersex people. They would make the world a hugely different place for us. I think so, uh, which is why like tonight, like I think over the last couple of months and talking about raising them, it has felt much more foresty, like talking about gender creative parenting as this movement and like broad philosophy. But I'm excited to talk with you tonight because I think intersex justice is such an important part of why we're doing gender creative parenting. Um, what I'll do for people who like might be new to this, I'll explain what gender creative parenting means to me. And then you can explain what, you know, intersex means um, so that we can kind of help bridge this for people and to show actually just how intertwined these movements that both of us are, you know, activists in, um, how they're um, really entangled. Um, so, so just in case you're new to gender creative parenting, what that means, um, it's a movement and a philosophy and a practice that gives children gender freedom and autonomy and it teaches children about gender as a limitless spectrum instead of a binary. And so what that means for me, I didn't assign a gender to my kid when they were born. I don't publicly disclose their reproductive anatomy, genitals um, to people who don't need to know. I use they, them pronouns for Zoomer from the start and really worked hard to create an environment that was anti-sexist and fighting gender-based oppression. And there are two main reasons why I do gender creative parenting. And the first is because I know and love a lot of intersex people and transgender people and non-binary and queer people. And I understand gender to be something that is self-determined. And so I want my parenting to reflect that. And then the second reason that I do gender creative parenting is because I'm a sociologist and every day I study gender inequality and I don't think that the gender binary is doing anybody any favors. And so I wanted to parent in a way that was a daily consistent protest against the patriarchy and the binary. So I'm an advocate and a member of this growing community of gender creative parents globally. Like I had no community in 2016 when Zoomer was born. It took me about a year to start finding community. And now I know of hundreds of people who do gender creative parenting. And like I see these birth announcement of birth announcements of these babies like every single month. And it feels so good to know that I'm like a part of this movement. Um, so I wanted to use this event as an opportunity to focus on the Venn diagram of gender creative parenting and intersex justice. And that's why Pigeon is here. Um, so I want to invite you, Pigeon, to talk more about what intersex means and tell us about whatever you want us to know about your own experience. Well, I too am seeing the rise in parents doing the same thing, um, which makes me so happy. Actually, I just got a baby shower announcement and it's in gender neutral colors and they're <laughs> raising the baby, you know, the same way. Cool. Um, so that was my first time getting a real paper gender neutral baby shower announcement. Um, and I, that is really uh, beautiful and amazing. And then you know how they say God don't like ugly. Well, you see what happens to these gender uh, reveals in the forest, God be setting shit on fire. So obviously people need to stop with this binary gender thing because God don't like ugly. And that's why stuff's starting on fire because people keep upholding this freaking binary that's not serving nobody as you beautifully stated. So I am intersex and what intersex means is literally probably in Latin or something between sexes, um, which is, some people would argue is not true, but I'm okay with that. I'm also understand myself as outside of the sex binary. Um, or the traditional ways of understanding the sex binary. I was born in 86, 1900s. You too? Yeah. What's your birthday? July 10th. <gasps> My sister's a cancer. Uh, she's July 15th. I'm March 15th. Okay, so 86. And I was born with a female looking body. So I was sent home as an assigned female. Six months later, 
my pediatrician was like, hmm, something's up with this kid's genitalia. It looks different. And in her words, swollen. So she sent me, or she sent my mom and me to the specialists at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. They ran some blood work, discovered that I did not have chromosomes typical for a child with my external genitalia, which was a vulva. So I had XY chromosomes and they would expect a child like that to have XX chromosomes. So then they just, they uh, diagnosed me as being uh, a bunch of things back then. And then eventually they transitioned the language consistently to calling me or diagnosing me as having uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. And uh, yeah, so, so that's kind of what they thought I had. And kids with androgen insensitivity or AIS are generally raised female because we look female on the outside. So they also then do things to remove the parts of us that are ambiguous or male. And so I had undescended testes, like all AIS kids. And so they decided to remove those before I was even one years old. Because, you know, testes doesn't line up with what society says a normal female child should have. So the doctors were like, those are useless. I just threw them away. And then when I was four, they decided my clitoris was too big for a normal girl. And so they also just got rid of that as well. They told my parents they were going to minimize it and with uh, and and maintain the nerves. But um, they they got rid of all the external um, portion of the clitoris without telling my parents. And then when I was 11, they gave me a vaginoplasty under the guise of saying it was to fix my bladder and my urethra, which I believed because I was having urination issues at that time when I was 10, I would stand up after peeing on the toilet and um, pee would dribble out like a few drops. So they were like, oh, we're gonna fix that. But when I was under anesthesia, they gave me a vaginoplasty. The closest word to it is vaginoplasty because it wasn't like, it, it's different for intersex people. So, but basically it was, it's, it's called the vaginoplasty, but a little bit different. So yeah. And then they didn't tell me any of this. And they told my parents to tell me that I was born with cancer in my ovaries, which I never had ovaries. I had undescended testes, if you remember. And I grew up thinking I was a cancer survivor, a girl who was a cancer survivor and loving my doctors because they saved my life at Lurie Children's. And um, because I got my ovaries taken out to save my life, they told me I couldn't have kids and wouldn't get a period. So all of this made sense and I believed it um, until I was 18 and got in touch with, or went to college and learned about intersex in my psychology of women class. And I was like, this sounds like me. And then um, I got my medical records from my mom. Well, my mom got them sent to her in the mail because I was 18 and the children's hospital kicks you out. And I called my mom after going to class that day and confirmed with her basically from the medical records that I had androgen insensitivity syndrome, which after Googling, I realized was an intersex variation. And there's about 35 or so intersex variations out there. And that's the one that I supposedly had. So that led me into a journey of meeting my first intersex person who was a speaker in my college classroom. And she encouraged me to get my medical records. When I got my medical records, coincidentally, my Lurie Children's Hospital was across the street at the time from my college. So I just literally had to walk across the street. Mm -hmm. And when I got my medical records, um, oh, I see for the first, and, and I'm still like identifying as a cis, but I didn't know the word cis, but I was a cis woman, straight identified person, um, went to an all girls Catholic high school, you know, just came out of that environment, was working at Abercrombie and Fitch as one of the girls in the front who was like supposed to look cute and get people to come in and spray them with perfume or whatever. And then I get my medical records and they say male pseudo hermaphrodite 46 XY on the first page in handwriting. Oh my God, my world was like, 
just spinning and I just was like what the fuck like am I a boy I was like doing that I was like looking in the mirror and pulling my hair back and I was like oh my god I'm a boy I was supposed to be a boy I thought I was a boy and they changed me or something Mm -hmm. and I always had a mustache growing up but I guess that really has nothing to do with being intersex because every woman in my family has a mustache but um (laughs) I thought like okay that's why I have a mustache I'm a boy and then so um But then I like, I laugh right now, but I sunk into this huge depression and couldn't focus on school or anything. And slowly but surely, I decided to, well, I didn't decide, but I kind of came around to becoming like a speaker or an advocate for intersex people like myself. And I did my thesis on the topic in undergraduate and got to meet other intersex activists that way, uh, including the first one ever who started the movement and that inspired me along with something else. Like I went to the Oprah show, the intersex one that my friend was on Mm. and that inspired me to see intersex people tell the world that they were intersex because at that point I was still um, too ashamed to tell anybody. But when I was in the audience of that episode, I got inspired because they were doing it. And I was like, oh, if they can do it, I can do it hopefully one day. And so that sort of after undergraduate and doing my thesis and meeting other intersex activists, um, I I became an intersex activist myself. And so that's my story. And I think that if, and we can talk about this later, but I think that if we raised every child or if there just was no binary gender that was forced or, you know, yeah, if there was no binary gender forced on children, intersex wouldn't, the oppression and the discrimination that intersex people uh, experience at the hands of the medical institutions and society at large wouldn't exist because there would be no propulsion to um, forcibly forcibly and surgically mold or shape an intersex person's body into Mm -hmm. something normal cosmetically, which is only female or male looking on the outside. So I love this movement and um i think it's the future and it's it's now and it's the future and it's as it's super necessary because like you said it doesn't the binary doesn't serve anybody um Mm -hmm. at all even men cis men like i feel so bad for them like (laughs) most of the time um and I feel bad for cis women and I feel bad for trans people, you know, in terms of the discrimination and oppression that we all face. Mm-hmm. And it's just ridiculous. And my kids are, my cousins are very fertile. So I have a new baby like every six months in my life. And even the ways that I participate in the creation or the upholding of fake gender stuff is, re- it's so ingrained in me, even though I have a women in gender studies master's degree i'm intersex i t- i'm non-binary and then i'm like oh i want to buy my little cousin a pink shoes you know like and it's just like but i'm like but it's cute and i try to like rationalize it and i'm like i'm actively adding to that and yeah. there's other things i do that are not so that are even more subtle um and i see the ways that all of us in the family are all complicit in constructing this child's gender and then tricking ourselves at the same time into believing that gender is this natural thing that just follows their genitalia which literally makes no sense because we punish children for stepping for not doing gender right and I see it like every day with tons of kids and it happened you know it happened to me it happens to everybody right and not everybody maybe not zoomer but um that's why I I uh I'm very interested in this topic because it blows my mind how it's like this myth that our culture has and we all it's like we all buy into it and we Mm -hmm. all think it's natural but it's actually we're all actively constructing and building it like lego blocks Mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting to me and it's really tied into intersex oppression yeah i um first thank you so much for sharing your story and i think that i found out i like i learned what intersex was too as a college student and and it was like in, you know, in learning about it and hearing like, oh yeah, like intersex people are about 2% of the population, like, you know, like a similar rate to people who are like redheads, you know? And I'm like, my mom's a redhead, you know? Like I know lots of redheads, you know? And so I think that that clicked for me of like, I 
totally know intersex people, you know, they may not, they may not tell me that they're intersex, but like, of course, out of all of the people who I've met in my life, of course, I know and love some intersex people. And then um, like we had talked about of like, but even some intersex people don't know that they are intersex, you know, so, and don't have to tell you, you know, like, so, so that clicked for me when I was thinking about gender creative parenting of like, there's totally a possibility that my child could be intersex. And um, so I remember like when I got pregnant with Zoomer, I got genetic testing done because I'm the carrier of this lethal disease. We need to see if Zoomer had it. And so like, I got this, you know, these results back that had sex chromosomes, you know, and it's like, okay, like I didn't read into it too much. And I think a huge part of that is because I know intersex people, you know, and was just like, I'm not going to see these sex chromosomes and then go, oh, bing, I can see my child's whole future and destiny and job and personality and interest. And so, you know, I was holding space for this possibility that Zoomer could be intersex. They could be non-binary. They could be cisgender. Like, who knows, right? Like, I can't tell anything about what my kid's going to be like from any information I have about their anatomy or physiology. And so throughout Zoomer's whole life, I have really wanted to, and and have like taught them about sex and gender in a way that includes and celebrates intersex people. Like if I'm not seeing intersex characters in kids' books, then I'll create them, you know, like, and this friend is intersex, you know, and Zimmer's <laughs> like, okay. So, so, cause I didn't, I wasn't raised like that. I had no idea. I, I don't, I don't ever hear, you know, I don't think that I ever heard the word intersex, you know, uttered out of my parents' mouth or a teacher's mouth, um, you know, before college. And, and now I'm a teacher. I, I teach in the university and I teach sociology of gender and sexuality. And too often, it's in my class that students are learning about intersex for the first time, you know, at like 18 or 20 or 24. And so I think that that's changing though. Like even over the last five years, yes. more and more of my students know about intersex, right. Or know of people or, of, or know who you are. And I think that that's so powerful that like this activism that you are doing is really helping bring intersex awareness into the mainstream, you know, like that people know about it now so much. And it's not as like mystifying, I think, as people thought even not that long ago. So thank you for being a total pioneer, I, th- I think, um, you know, for moving this along. Um, will you talk a bit about your activism, like with Intersex Justice Project? And you've had some pretty incredible victories you know, recently um, with, with your activism and would you talk about that? Yes, sure. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, I'm trying to absorb everything you just said because it was so great. And also my activism. Um, So Intersex Justice Project developed out of a desire to create something that was intersex people of color centered and led because at the time there wasn't anything like that that I know of and I was also burnt out of working well first of all I was in grad school before and in grad school I had a job that was in high schools and it was about teen dating violence prevention so that paid for my grad school but it was like a part-time job and then I had a part-time job at Interact so I was the youth leadership coordinator, I think at that time. And it was, you know, 15 or 20 intersex youth who are all traumatized in similar ways <laughs> as me. And it's a nonprofit. So it's a lot of like fundraising and filling out the forms, you know, for the money, like, like two and a half intersex kids have changed in this way. I'm like two and a half, like how, <laughs> anyway. So then, um, so I was burnt out of school. I was burnt out of the nonprofit world. I was burnt out of just white people being in the face of intersex stuff, um, being the face of intersex stuff. And I remember, I just wrote this actually today, um, that I was in New York for some reason, I don't know why. And I was in a cheap, cheapest Airbnb I could find because um, I was broke. And it was one of those Airbnbs where you share like bunk beds with random people you don't know, basically a hostel. And then this hostel, 
had those walls that didn't go all the way up so you can hear everything. And there was cats there that were just taking dumps all the time and it smelled horrible. And so anyways, I had this moment where I'm like, let me call my two intersex friends, Linnell who, and Saifa. Linnell is the first intersex person I ever met who came to my class and spoke maybe eight years prior to this or 10 years prior. And so I was like, hey guys, thanks for answering the call. Um, do you guys want to start a project that's just like people of color intersex project and like fuck shit up and like not rely on grants and things. And because I hate grants and I hate the nonprofits. And so they're like, they're like, yeah, let's do it. So um, we had like a long name. It was like intersex people of color for justice, IPOC J. And then it turned into just intersex justice project, IJP. And we done uh, about four years ago, we started with just writing statement, collective statements on Intersex Awareness Day and demanding things. And then we organized protests in Chicago where at Lurie, where I was a patient. And we looked around at the landscape and um, the nonprofit world was attacking the intersex issue from a legal standpoint and trying to fight um, federal and state uh, court cases uh, to end the surgeries and they weren't going anywhere. And it took almost decades of resor resources and time and energy. And other folks were doing like human rights, the, the human rights angle, like trying to get the UN to whatever, keep making statements. And I was in the room for those meetings and I was on working for those organizations doing that stuff. And I just saw it as a dead end and it, I, I saw it as contributing and helping, but I didn't see it as like the quickest way to getting to what I wanted, which was just for an end to these surgeries. Um, I'm a very somewhat optimistic person, even though my life was kind of fucked up. But when I first found this out, I thought, oh, I'll just tell my story once and then all the hospitals will end like their surgeries. Cause I was like, everyone will hear my story. Think, no, it's so horrible. And then there's no way the, the, her surgeries could keep going on. And yet I told my story to everyone that would listen, a, you know, AP, BuzzFeed, Al Jazeera, et cetera. And um, nothing changed ever. And it was just like, okay, well, that's not enough. So IJP was like looking at the history of intersex activism. And when it started in the early nineties, there was some emphasis on protests in the streets. And the first protest was a trans and intersex joint um, protest at the American Academy of Pediatrics in Boston in 96. And so we wanted to revive that history of protesting, intersex protesting and trans together so in solidarity. And so we organized our first protest and the hashtag was Lurry and surgery because it rhymed. And we made our banners, we made our signs and we had people show up and make the art with us. So we came up with our chants. And one of my favorite chants is um, uh, fix your hearts, not our parts. And we would chant things like that outside of Lurie Children's Hospital while their patients and the parents are walking in and out and the workers are walking in and out downtown Chicago in this ritzy neighborhood where Lurie moved to. And they were, and we were pass passing out flyers and, they, and the people were like, this happens here because mm. this is a world renowned children's hospital that's always begging people for money and fundraisers and showing all the good stuff they do. And they never market the fact that they do intersex surgeries. And so we were like, yes, this is still happening. This happens here and it's still happening. And um, that was really amazing to see workers that didn't even know that that was happening in their institution because it's so clandestine, clandestine, clandestine. And we then um, ended that protest and um, Lurie didn't care. I mean, they came out, they had gave a press release. They called the police on us before we came. They issued an internal memo and said we were um, intersex activists with an extreme, extreme point of view or something, something with extreme in it. And um, we have an extreme point of view when it comes to intersex patients and blah, 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 and that they called the police, et cetera, et cetera, and just be cautious. And so, and then they were, their PR department came out and gave a press release to the local media that, or the media, yeah, local media that was there, like the news stations and things. And they just like watched us. They were like, hmm, 
like that. And I was just like, I can't stand you guys. Mm-hmm. And so we did more protests there. And then the hashtag became from blurry and surgery to just end intersex surgery because what I was saying earlier is we realized the national movement to end surgery and the international movement wasn't going anywhere fast. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to focus on one hospital since we were only three people who started this organization and we had no funding. So we all did it in like our volunteer time, part-time or off time. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted end intersex surgery to be the hashtag because we also didn't want to just be about Larry, but we wanted people to see that this could be done and then they can use the hashtag and the movement at their local hospitals as well. So eventually after many protests and marches and train takeovers and um, online you know, education and tweets and uh, campaigns and poster making that we gave to people and asked them to post in their cities that say end intersex surgery, we finally had um, this uh, good moment this summer. Um, I remember thinking throughout the campaign and even before the campaign with other things that were going on, I always thought these, oh, this is the moment they're gonna stop doing the surgeries. Like, oh, this is it. Like, uh, and then they would just keep doing it. And one of those moments was the ACLU worked with IJP and, and Interact and others to write a letter to Lurie telling them all the laws they're breaking in Illinois, possibly like not giving informed consent to patients and um, something else, I forget, it'll come to me. And Lurie was like, thanks for your time, but we're gonna keep doing what we're doing, toodles. And then I was like, oh my God, they don't even care about the ACLU. And then, um, so I was feeling again, really burnt out and like I was before IJP. And I asked my partner, my colleague, my co-founder if you know I could take a sabbatical. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I gotta write this book and maybe I'll take a sabbatical this summer cause I'll start writing the book this summer and I'll come back in October around Intersex Awareness Day. Well, my sabbatical lasted a week and then I got my genetic test results back and found out cause yeah anyways found out i don't even have androgen insensitivity syndrome like they diagnosed me so i was misdiagnosed i'm still i still have like an intersex variation but it's not that one and the the marquee or the the big the big marker of that one that they thought i said i had is that those people cannot synthesize testosterone or androgens you're androgen insensitive so they got rid of my testes, got rid of my clitoris, raised me female, only gave me a low dose of estrogen since I was 10, never gave me testosterone, etc. Turns out I can properly synthesize testosterone 100% and have no problem with that. And I don't have androgen sensitivity. So that blew my mind. I was 34 when I found this out, it was this summer. And I went on Twitter and got mad. I got Twitter fingers. And I was calling out all the doctors, even my queer friendly LGBTQ clinic, because I was calling them out for not ever checking the fact that my estrogen was so low. It was like below five at some points and they never did anything about it. I get my blood tested every six months. And so I was just calling everybody out, including Lurie, of course, because I always call out Lurie, but I was even calling out the doctors I liked because I was like, y'all suck too. Cause you don't even know how to take care of intersex or non-binary people, but you claim you do. Mm-hmm. And so, um, that tweet got a lot of uh, retweets and the campaign started to heat up again. And then uh, somebody was like, hey, check out this doctor's Instagram, which is one of the doctors at Lurie's intersex clinic who I know and I don't like. And through her page, I see that the trans clinic at Lurie had an Instagram page and on it was all these celebrities who are trans and non-binary, including one of my closest friends, India Moore. I was like, oh, hell no, they are not using her face, their face without their consent to promote this like trans friendly image. Meanwhile, they're doing these um, human rights violation surgeries to intersex kids in their sister clinic, the intersex portion. So I sent the screenshots of the Instagram to India. India didn't even tell me they went live instantly to a million plus subscribers or followers, whatever it's called on Instagram. And they were like, they were so mad. And they were telling their followers like about the end intersex surgery um, campaign that IJP started and that they need to call out Lurie and that 
um, learn that you cannot step on intersex people's necks to to uphold and um, trans patients and trans people. And that was so powerful for me to hear from a trans celebrity and friend of mine. And that rallied all these people to go comment on Larry's Instagram page where all their most recent posts had like 500 comments and they were like, stop doing intersex surgery. Oh, this is nice, but you're still doing intersex surgery. And it was just like one after another, after another. And it was like hilarious. And then celebrities started getting involved like Jamila Jamil was like, take my picture down. I don't support intersex surgery. Um, Hunter Schaefer um, and a bunch of other celebrities. And then um, even uh, Dwayne Wade's wife. Um, Gabrielle Union. Oh, thank you, Gabrielle Union. I am the worst with names and celebrity names. And Gabrielle Union tweeted about our campaigns, um, change.org thing. I think she saw it on India's page or somebody's page, maybe Jamila Jamila or something. And then all of a sudden our campaign, which had been up for three or four years and had about a couple thousand, six, no, maybe like, I don't know, but it swelled like four or five times within a week because of the celebrities sharing it. Yeah. So now I'm like, oh my God, I'm on sabbatical, but oh my God, like we've oh never God. had this much pressure <laughs> on Lurie. And then that's the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm on Twitter a week later, scrolling. And one of my favorite rock stars, who's a Chicago trans artist named Supernova, I forgot or didn't realize that they work at Lurie in that trans clinic. Mm -hmm. And mind you, I've been to their shows. I buy their t-shirts because I love their shows, their music. And they've been to our protests, but I'd never realized or put two and two together that they work in the trans clinic at Lurie Children's. They go on Twitter and said, you know what? I can't stand for this anymore as an employee of the adolescent medical health, whatever, they have some weird euphemism, but they're the trans clinic. And we are still doing um, horrible things to intersex kids and I'm complicit in it by not speaking up and, and I need to call it out finally once and for all. That was the first time a worker in a hospital where surgeries are happening was brave enough to call out intersex surgeries. Mm -hmm. Then the next day, another person did it that worked there, a third person did it the day after, a fourth person did it, and then a fifth person did it. So now we have five public, five employees of Larry Children's speaking out for the end intersex surgery campaign. Our campaign was just three things. One, apologize, two, end the surgeries, three, create a reparations fund for survivors of your medical abuse. So they were asking their followers and stuff to sign our petition and to demand that Larry does those things. It was ground shifting. It was crazy. I got chills. I knew it was over. I mean, I was like 99% sure it was over for Lurie because you got celebrities, you got your own workers calling you out. You got us calling you out. You got all the years and decades of activists doing this work with the same message. We've never changed our message. And within a week or so, maybe two weeks, we get word that they are putting a moratorium for six months on all intersex surgeries that are not life-saving, which are the majority of them. And they're gonna restructure the way they approach their intersex care and hire, I think they said two intersex people to work with them as liaisons, um, as they rebuild their program and et cetera, et cetera. And so that was this huge moment. Um, and that's what happened this summer. And that, that, that was, that was huge. And then like, I think a month later, Boston Children's followed suit mm -hmm. and announced a similar announcement. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's, it's happening. Like intersex surgeries are ending and gender creative parenting is beginning. And it's a beautiful synchronous, uh, parallel and synchronous phenomenon happening together. I think so. Do they, did like Lurie's or Boston children, like, do they reach out to Intersex Justice Project and be like, hello, can you, like, do they invite you to talk to them at all? Or is this just all happening like behind the scenes and like, they're not acknowledging IJP or do so, they? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, when I was in graduate school, I offered to work at the Intersex Clinic for free at Lurie mm. as an intern because I was studying gender and also health communication 
and I proposed my internship and handed it to them. And this was before I was calling them out on Twitter and all that. So I wasn't, they weren't like as mad at me as they are now. And so they ignored me. They never wrote me back or anything. And here I was offering free services to be an intersex advocate that can talk to parents, talk to patients. I went to their hospital for 18 years on and off and they ignored me. Hmm. And so um, <laughs> the first time they stopped ignoring me was when I gave a StoryCorps interview and they used a clip of my story on um, NPR. And then the PR department of the hospital called me freaking out. And then two days later, they, uh, the surgeon, the department at the intersex clinic called me and they apologized for the PR people calling me and they said they wanted to talk to me. So mm -hmm. I met with them and they wanted to meet, I met with the surgeon, the lead surgeon and the uh, clinic coordinator. And my boss at the time at Interact was a lawyer and she didn't want me going to that meeting alone. So she, she literally flew to Chicago to meet with, to be there with me. Huh. And like, Here's my just, lawyer. <laughs> yeah. And she goes, I'm going to bring my briefcase just to scare them. <laughs> yes. So she like put her briefcase down and then, um, I'm glad she came because I was younger at that time and they had me meet in a basement of a train station that has no windows. And it was at a coffee shop in the basement of the train station. So it's like, we were in this like windowless place and it was this huge like surgeon guy and then the clinic coordinator and it would have just been me. But when they saw my lawyer there, they were like, who is she? And she's like, hi, I'm attorney Antamar Mattis. I'm with, N back then it was called AIC. I'm with Interact and da, 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 da. And I just had a layover in Chicago and thought I'd help my friend come visit my friend or whatever, Pigeon. <laughs> and they were like, because she, she was actually flying to Oklahoma that day to do a deposition with an endocrinologist there about intersex surgery stuff for a court case. And they knew her name. So they were scared of her because wow. to them, she was an op. And they were like, oh my God, you're the person that's trying to get us shut down. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, that's my, that's my lawyer. And so at the end of the conversation, after having to hear the surgeon talk about how great he was for two hours, he then said, I want to be the one to do right in my community of surgeons and this and that. Mm -hmm. And so my lawyer friend was like, well, are you willing to be accountable publicly for the harm that your profession has caused intersex patients, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> he's like, I can't do that. And then they're like, well, what can you do? And so mm -hmm. he was like, he agreed to let me and another youth from Interact uh, come and give them a presentation to his clinic. So we did, it was all anti-surgery, you know, pro intersex autonomy. And they were an hour and a half late to our meeting and they didn't take any of what we said into consideration and they didn't do anything we asked because wow. they didn't care. They were just like, oh, you're little kids. Like, we don't need to listen to you. You don't have power or clout, so forget y'all. So then we formed IJP years later and they don't talk to us at all. Like they hate us. Actually, I was told through the grapevine multiple times by different people that Earl Chang, the, the, the surgeon, would ask them to ask me to stop mentioning his name on Twitter. But that's as much like conversation we had. And that just made me mention his name more because I knew it was getting to him, even though he doesn't have a Twitter. So um, I was like, yes, it's working. Thank you, Earl, for letting me know. And then... Um, you know, when we worked with the ACLU, we had a conversation, should we be in the room? And we decided no, because it might be a distraction or like to the process because we're so adversarial with them. Mm -hmm. And like, I literally will just say things like, like I just call them out. I put their pictures on a Twitter and I'll say like, this guy cuts intersex kids clits and like, and look at his shit grin smile. Like, so I don't think I should really be in the room because we might um, miss the point because they uh, don't like me and I don't like them. Yeah. So I we've worked with them, but through mediators like the ACLU and Interact and other um, people like doctors who are on our side, but who are willing to be in the room with them. And mm -hmm. they just didn't care though. It was like multiple times with every other effort. So it wasn't until like the protests ramped up, the campaign, um, the, the signature campaign thing ramped mm -hmm. up and the public pressure 
on the trans clinic, which is the sister clinic of the intersex clinic. And so, you know, they're all about funding. So if they look bad and celebrities that are trans are calling the trans clinic out, mm -hmm. then that's a bad thing for them to get funding. And that all of a sudden with, it was like a perfect avalanche. Um, yeah. There was a new CEO that year as well, this year. Yeah. And he was like, make this problem go away. And the other thing we did is we worked with people that work at Lurie on the low and we were getting reports back from them every day and also like able to understand what was going on behind the scenes and we were able to find out that there was at least 15 or 20 people who weren't publicly speaking out but who were on our side and they were all putting pressure on Earl Chang and his team on the intersex side to um to end the surgeries so it was really this like combined effort of like celebrity pressure um, community pressure in terms of the coalition coming out there and protesting and doing things online. Um, interact, uh, allies who are doctors, other intersex activists, and the CEO putting pressure on them and just all these, this perfect storm happened. And so while we didn't ever sit down in the room with them, our presence was always felt oh, yeah, it was. Oh. in a better way, almost, uh, yeah, like, so. in an almost more powerful way. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah thank you pigeon i can't wait to read your book i can't wait to read the chapter of like the scene in like the like slave train station <laughs> and i think i can't wait to watch like the movie um pigeon i have learned so much about it and i'm so glad that um more people you know are being able to hear your story and that you're changing people's lives. Like I, I like what you said about, you know, these things like this intersex, ending intersex surgeries movement and gender creative parenting are, are really happening at the same time. And I just so want people to know who have beautiful, perfect intersex babies, you know, to, to know like you do not have to parent this awesome child within this broken shitty binary and you know and I love that there is um there's just so many more resources for people who want to do gender creative parenting and I really I really want like the intersex world and the gender creative parenting world to just like um I, I want people to know about each other just so much more um so before we go into the q a i just want to ask you um what are like whoops, sorry my cup what are if if what are three points like what are three take-home points you know that you want our audience to leave with you know and like chew on um tonight and tomorrow and next week and talk to their you know the people in their life about what are like you know whatever three i'm just throwing that out there but what are the what are the take home points you want us to know? Mm, I would say like that gender creative parenting and in ending intersex surgery are parallel because you know if we are advocating for letting intersex kids have their bodily autonomy then a lot of parents are going to say, well, then how do I raise this child? So if there isn't this movement of gender creative parenting, then there's not a soft place for these parents to land. And then I think the surgeries are more likely to continue mm -hmm. if people don't understand that there's alternatives. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I would say, and this is something you just, I mean, I'm just basically saying what you said, but you said, you said that, um, you know, just take your, when you have a child, just love them. Um, I think you said that, I, I, I might be paraphrasing, but there's an intersex documentary that's for free on um, YouTube and Amazon Prime. It's called Intersections, the movie. Um, and there's this doctor in there who's been an ally of ours for a long time named Milton Diamond. I think it was him or it was this person named Katrina Carcasis who's, um, an, an ally, but not intersex herself. One of them said like, what should happen and the, when an intersex child is born? And, and one of them answered, just take their child, take your child home and love them like you would any other child. That's all that really needs to happen to intersex kids, all kids. Um, and it reminds me 
of a quote of your book on page 68, where you're talking to your dad and you were worried about letting him know about gender creative parenting, I believe. And he said that like, while he doesn't understand, like fully understand it, he supports you and that he's gonna love his grandbaby just as he loves you, his child. And I think that's the takeaway for me and all of this is just love children. Like, it's so easy. Um, I mean, okay, it's not that easy. It's like really hard to raise children. But um, when you break it down to the fundamentals, like if all your decisions, I wanna say if all your decisions are driven by love of your child, then you'll be good. But that's not true because some people think differently about loving their children and what that means. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you gotta learn to like, really, I guess, love yourself and trust yourself and and do a lot of work on yourself so that you can then model that for your child and also then love and trust and give trust to your children. And when you love and trust them, you'll trust them with their own bodily autonomy and their own um, gender, coming, uh, letting them come up with uh, figuring out their own gender identity as they grow up. And if they're intersex and have an ambiguous genitalia body, then you, you would trust them enough to to grow up and decide for themselves if they want any cosmetic surgeries. Um, so I think that would be my second takeaway. And the third one um, would be that, oh, I'm like, did my cats just bark? But that's my neighbor's dog. Um, <laughs> my third one would be, and this is like generic, it has nothing to do with this conversation, but the saying, the old saying that um, like life is short and just want to remind people of that that you know we're not we're not here forever and um, make you know do what brings you joy as much as you can and take time out of your day um, especially off social media if you're addicted to it like I am and was and struggling to get off of. Um, and really take time for yourself and, and write your bucket list out, whatever it is, and, and just put it up on a wall so you can have those goals and try to do some of those things before you leave this earth in this physical being or way. And um, and just, yeah, try to like love more, you know, like try to have, be able to put more energy, as much energy as you need to and want to into your loving relation, your friendships and your relationships. Because I think at the end of the day, that's all that exists at the end of the day, like when all is said and done, um, is the energy that is created by the love you have for your friends and family and lovers and children. And so try to really emphasize or prioritize that. Um, yeah, I think those are my three takeaways. I love that. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, well, thank you both so much. Uh, this has been absolutely wonderful so far. Um, I have just a few questions for y'all. Um, the first one is for Pigeon, um, and I know it can be kind of hard to gauge these things, but do you have an idea of when your book might be coming out? Oh, I do. <laughs> um, they say it, should, it will come out fall of 2021. Awesome. Yeah, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's untitled as of yet, um, but yeah cool i'm, I'm gonna try to out that for that yeah. awesome um, and there's gonna be an audio book yeah. yeah are you reading it huh? are you reading it awesome yeah. awesome yeah. the next question that i have is for both of you um and yeah, I don't know, maybe some of the folks that are watching right now are struggling with this, um, but I wanted to ask, what advice would you give to young people who are struggling with the gender they were assigned at birth that do not have the support of their family? Mm -hmm. Struggling with what at birth? Um, struggling with the gender they were assigned at birth. Oh, got it. Kyle, I talked a lot. I'm gonna let you take this. Start um, with So, I think one of the one of the best things that is available to so many folks right now is online community. I, like I know that that's where I have found 
people like me or people who um, are helping me learn about experiences or frameworks or language. And so I know just online community has actually been a really wonderful place for me to find support um, in places like with doing gender creative parenting or talking about gender or doing something that maybe like the majority of folks don't agree with. Um, but I'm sorry that that's happening. Um, I know that that can be um, really, really difficult to be not feeling supported and affirmed in who you are. Um, but online community has really been a big, a big place for me. Um, Pigeon, do you have anything to add there? Same. Um, as an intersex person, the only community I had at first was online. Um, and it was a lifeline for so many of us. And we would meet up once a year if you could afford to get to the conference. There was scholarships, so, but not for everybody. Anyways, online community, it's very great um, for whatever your, your identity is. I would also say, um, ask yourself what you need support for and why you need that support. And maybe if you can get it somewhere else. So maybe it's not gonna come from your parents. Um, maybe you're young and it has to be your parents, but if you're older and it doesn't have to come from them, try to map out where else can you get the support you need, whether that's a therapist, whether that's friends, whether that's whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, try to figure out a way to support yourself. So try to get to a point in your life where you don't need them. And then you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna need you all of a sudden. And then they're not gonna care so much about your identity when they need your help or like your support. So, and also if that doesn't even happen, it doesn't matter because you've already built an infrastructure for your own support without them. But I, I've come to realize like I had an aunt growing up who identified as straight, but she was so queer. Like she was like <laughs> the butchest woman alive but she was also the straightest woman alive it was so weird but she was kind of like she just doesn't care she never cared what people thought about her and so i grew up with that role model and i was never like that like i always internalized what people thought about me and cared about me but as i get older i'm always trying to think like what would my auntie barbara do or say or feel in this moment and so i think it could be a goal to like get to auntie barbara status where it's like you just don't give a fuck. Like, okay, you don't fuck with me, then I don't fuck with you or whatever. Or I still fuck with you even if you don't fuck with me and I'm gonna come over on holidays and eat your food and tell you I'm just here for food and then leave, which is what my aunt would do. And everyone loved her because she was just so authentically herself because she didn't give a fuck. And so I feel like if we can get to that status, it really helps because it's like, you don't really need that support. I mean, everyone needs support, humans need support, but like, Sometimes we just can't get it from our parents. And there's so many, if you think about it, there's so many queer people and trans people who that's never going to be a possibility. Like I think in the US, we see it in the media as a possibility. So we want it, but we have to remember that the majority of people never get that. They don't get to talk to their parents about being queer. They don't, whatever, they're just not going to get that. And so if they can make it, so can you. And you're going to have to just build your own community, which is part of the queer experience or the trans experience is like building family. And what's awesome about that is the family is going to probably be a lot better than your bio family. And, um, but yeah, nothing replaces bio family, but it's, it's, there's also some really good perks and benefits of when you get to create your own family as well. Yeah. yeah. I just was going to add, like, I like the mentioning of the confidence, like when you have this confidence, it is easier, you know, to, to recognize like it, there's nothing wrong with me. It's, it's the, like the world, you know, it's this binary system that is the problem. I am not the problem, you know, like my identity, my experience. And so really, I know that that's so much easier said than done, but just, it's like a muscle that you have to flex of like, it's not me, it's, it's the world. And like, and it's changing, you know, it might not be changing fast enough, but like having that confidence and finding that community to help, like, hype you up you know yeah. because it really is it's it, you are not the problem the world is struggling you know and like you do not have to fit into what the world wants because we are moving on from that dusty old nasty model anyway yes hey yes. um thank you both so much um i have one last question for you and it's kind of piggybacking off of the last one um 
definitely want people to check out Raising Them and the Intersex Justice Project, of course, but um, I wanted to know if either of you had um, some other resources that you wanted to uh, like name or if you could think of any other resources for queer or intersex folks that might be watching. Sure, so I'll, I'll go first and say a couple. So as far as like gender creative parenting goes, um, there are so many more resources and advocates and some other words that we call it is gender open parenting and gender autonomous parenting. So just like Googling those terms, you can find so many amazing interviews and blogs and people who are really diverse and have really different stories. And so I think that that's really cool. And there's a website called um, babyparenting.com that has kind of curated a bunch of those resources. And I have those res a lot of resources on my website too. And if you are wanting to do gender, if you're wanting to do gender creative parenting, there's a Facebook group with over 500 people in it who are doing gender creative parenting. So there's already a really incredible online community that people can join um, to find resources and support. Yes, I love Facebook groups. It's the, it's why I call myself a grandpa because I love Facebook because of the groups. So. If you guys have Facebook, utilize the groups. It's the best thing. There's a group for everything and the communities are usually so supportive and helpful. Um, for intersex, there's a lot of Facebook groups that are um, private. So you have to like know someone to get in because you can't just search it. So reach out to any intersex activists such as myself or others and we can get you connected to those private groups. But there are also public groups and there's public groups for parents as well. So if you're a parent of an intersex baby and you just have questions, um, you can just look up like intersex parents on this Facebook groups tab. Um, so that's one resource. Another one I always share is the number four and then the word intersex spelled out dot org. It has, uh, it's broken down into four parts and it's like different ways that you can be an ally to intersex people, learn about intersex people, bug your senators about intersex people's rights. Um, bug your hospitals, local hospitals. And there's even a Google present slide presentation that you can download for free. And there's um, notes. So if you want to give a presentation to your community or whatever, um, you can do it. And there, the other resources I would say are go on YouTube. Uh, there's so many great, inter there's probably some bad ones too, but there's great intersex content. I have a playlist on my um, account. So it says like intersex resources and I just collect uh, helpful intersex videos and put them in there. Um, and then there's um, my film is really uh, good. I have two films. One is called The Sun I Never Had, and I'm trying to release it soon on YouTube uh, or somewhere for free. And I'm, I'm reworking the music right now. And, and um, when that's done, and I'm going to try to do a little bit more animations, and then I'm going to put that out there. But then there's another film that's done, and it's called a normal girl and you can order it from womenmakemovies.com or .org and they have yeah it's on there and um that's a great resource and again the intersections movie i mentioned it's free on youtube and amazon prime amazing documentary with 10 different people from all over the world i love that resource there's good books like just look up intersex amazing books out there um there's one called Raising Rosie, which is by parents of an intersex child who's also non-binary. Um, and the mom is a nurse and the dad is a professor of sociology, I believe. And they talk about raising their child in a gender, I don't know if they use the term, but in a gender creative way, who's also intersex. And they also had to fight um, doctors who kept coming in with bogus information saying, we need to do this clitoris reduction because the child could get UTIs. And they were like, uh we know how to do research and that's not true <laughs> like so that's a really great book it's called raising rosie and there's just so many intersex books out there now um and interact is a great resource um interact has a website interactadvocates.org they also have a great instagram and a great twitter um and then intersex justice project has a great website and um in the resources tab there's this uh file or this pdf called 26 Ways to Show Up for Intersex People, which we co-created with Interact. It's a great primer with links and 26 things and ways that you can show up for intersex people. And you get to learn about stuff as well, just reading that document. Um, 
I think everything I mentioned is in there, the films, the books, et cetera, it's all in there on the websites. So that might be the best place is to go to interact or intersexjusticeproject.org, click resources, and then look for the 26 ways to support intersex people. It's a great uh, resource. Awesome. Hey, well, thank you both so much. Um, I love all of the resources and the stories that you both shared. Um, this, this was a lovely conversation. Um, Thank you. Uh, my name is actually Salem. Um, I didn't change oh, the Zoom name on this. <laughs> I was gonna say, the bookstore named it. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, thank you, Salem. I I am so grateful to Weller Bookworks. Um, and I want to because this is my last event for a while. I do want to thank uh, Joey Soloway for yes. Yes. like giving me a chance to share my story through the imprint topple and little a um who like they're going to amplify pigeon story so i'm just really really grateful to them um raising them is available like please support weller bookworks if you don't have a copy yet please buy it from weller bookworks um and when pigeon's book comes out you can buy it from <laughs> weller bookworks too but thank you pigeon too for taking time out of your day and hanging out with me for an hour i really really appreciate it of course, this was beautiful and fun. And um, I also want to thank Joey Soloway. Uh, <laughs> I was standing in line one day at the White House and Joey was there and we became friends. And they invited me to be on their TV show as an intersex character. And then they were like, hey, do you want to write a book? And I was like, hey, yes, I lost all my jobs this year because of the pandemic. And so that was just like, they're always this like guardian angel for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so just shout out Joey, shout out Tapo and Little A Press and um, shout out this beautiful book. And I can't wait to read it and give it to my friends who are also raising kids in gender creative ways uh, for holidays and birthdays. And um, good luck in Australia. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Weller Books and Ladies.